All right, so good afternoon. I'm Greg Otto, and I lead the cloud platform engineering team at Comcast, and I have responsibilities for our pivotal Cloud Foundry environment. It's really an honor to be here. Any of the folks roaming around outside, if you want to come on in. So I'm really excited to be able to share with you an update on our journey since last year. And again, you know, we have the whole team here, all four of them. So we're really excited to talk to folks and, you know, we're going to be here uh, for the rest of the conference. So I'm going to leave plenty of time at the end for Q&A. So please um, make sure that you, if you're not going to ask questions during the session, feel free to stop us when we're walking around the conference. So for those that don't know, love it when the clicker doesn't work. So Comcast is a global, and NBC Universal is a global media and technology company. And a lesser known fact is that we actually have the world's largest IP network. It would be really awesome if my slides were working. Rob, do you have one? Sure. Your slides have part two. Can you give us a quick from previously on? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we, you know, we were here last year. So this is, you know, part two. Uh, I am definitely not in marketing because the title of my session kind of stinks. But um, yeah, last year when we were here, we were talking about our journey. So I spent, you know, quite a bit of time talking about how do we get involved with Cloud Foundry and how do we start. What were some of the challenges? And then today, what I'm going to share is I'm going to briefly cover that, and then I'm going to focus more on kind of where we've been since last year, and then what were you know some of the things that we're working on now, some of the changes in scope and scale for those that may have uh, seen us in the in the keynote with the panel. We gave some facts and figures, but this allows us an opportunity to provide more detail, more granular detail, and again, an opportunity to have an interactive discussion, which, you know, we really can't have on the main stage. So, again, Comcast, um, we have a lot of different products and services across, you know, all the different entities that we have. So, uh, we have a lot of great stories to share and uh, with respect to our adoption of Cloud Foundry. So for us, it started again briefly in 2013. We had some real challenges around our legacy applications. We had some brittle applications that were causing impacts to both the business and then also for our end customers. So the challenge from the business was, hey, you know, we need better stability. We need more resiliency around the applications that are being delivered to our customers and supporting our care organization. So that was a huge focus. But we also knew that this was a transformation, and I say this all the time, not just of the technology, but people as well. So we were very committed to investing in our development organization, creating a safe environment to change mindset and work in a new way with these newer methodologies around agile development and all the modern best practices for 12-factor apps, test-driven development, and so forth. So I'm going to share some of the things that worked well, and then we're also going to share some of the things that maybe didn't go so well, some lessons learned, and hopefully that will help you in your journey. So as we go through from the part one up to up till now, we'll highlight some of those some of those things. So in 2014 we got the foundation laid, and that wasn't just with the technology and the infrastructure, it was with getting agreement from our business partners at the executive level 
on what were the things, what were the metrics that they wanted to measure our success by, right? So we heard about the resiliency, time to market was certainly a, a key element there. And then of course with Comcast, we have challenges around scale. So <clears throat> we, one of the things that went really, really well was that we started this journey together. So this is hard stuff. There's no magic pixie dust. So you definitely want to bring lots of friends. And you know, going at this uh, in a better together type of approach is you know, really the best way to go. That's my best advice. And then, again, what we learned was you know, starting small, getting some of the DevOps teams, you know, early adopters was really key. Build success with them first. In 2015, we started to move some of the first services over. And again, what worked well was we tackled not just the easy things. We didn't want to just you know, get some easy wins. Uh, we wanted to focus on some real high value targets. And I think Chris shared during our keynote that uh, we picked three services to move and those were the services that were very, very active. It represented about 40% or about 100 million transactions on one of our critical platforms that process around 250 million transactions a day. So those three services are part of over 100 services in a monolithic application that we decided to move. So it was pretty ambitious. Definitely want to pick high value targets. Your ambition level might not be as high. Um, but you definitely want to pick things that are meaningful that you can demonstrate that business value. One of the things that we learned really quickly was don't try to boil the ocean. Don't take on things that uh, are, are even more complicated. So for us, what that meant was deferring the data persistence issues until after the initial migrations. So that allowed us to realize value more quickly and be able to start to see what success and uh, the, the uh, expected outcomes would be as we started to move some of the first services over. 2016 for us was a huge breakout year. You're going to see that in our operational metrics that we really stepped on the gas. We moved a ton of services, a ton of traffic over. Our most business critical and customer critical services that I'm also going to show are all running on this platform, activation systems, order entry systems, any of the customer kind of transactions that flow through our back office, our services that we've moved onto this platform. Some of the things that we learned and went well, really well was around <clears throat> embracing and accelerating the DevOps culture. So realizing the benefits of shifting things left with test-driven development, paired programming, and then, of course, the CI/CD pipelines, getting those established, realizing the benefits of having an effective CI/CD process. One of the things that we learned was to include the BAU teams up front. So, again, bringing things in, you know, bringing teams in earlier is really a big help. Definitely want to make sure that, again, the more folks that you include and the earlier that you do that, the better that your journey will be as well. So here are some of our operational metrics. I will get to the business outcomes. That's kind of the big reveal. Um, we shared some of these metrics last year, and they're significantly different. So we had about 490% growth last year. And then you can see from the top that we started our journey on our internal private cloud. There's some other folks that have actually started their journey on public cloud and are moving things internal. So our, our journey is kind of the reverse. Most of our Cloud Foundry environment and the transactions that are flowing through it are still running predominantly on our private cloud. But over the last couple of years, again, based on feedback from the development teams, we've enabled multi-cloud delivery to include cloud and multiple cloud providers. So that's a trend that we expect to continue. And again, it's really all about choice. So Cloud Foundry for us enables that choice so the developers can still focus on their code and their applications and building awesome products that deliver new experiences for our customers 
and they don't have to worry about what cloud provider that they're running on. So that was really powerful for us. And we're starting to see some of the application teams actually move it to a multi-cloud delivery model. So again, <clears throat> you know, the application growth, total hockey stick, right? Insane level of growth there. The number of developers, the number of developers has grown significantly. I think when I gave this talk last year, I probably should have remembered what the, what the number was. I think it was somewhere around 400 developers. Now we have over 1,500 developers that are innovating on our platform every day. And one of the really proud pieces for me is calling out our slackers. They're actually not slackers. We use Slack for real-time communication and collaboration. And we created a Slack channel for Cloud Foundry. We have over, we, we have almost 800 people. I don't know, it may have gone over 800 since uh, the you know, beginning of the conference. But having, first of all, having over half of your customer base actively communicating, collaborating in real time on a daily basis is pretty incredible. But what's really rewarding for me, and this was not a planned outcome, it just was something that happened, it was a residual benefit, but it's really a, a, another transformational moment for us because it's changing the way that we're communicating and collaborating. So we have development teams that are otherwise never talking to each other because they're working on separate products. And not only are they helping each other with respect to Cloud Foundry, but they're helping each other with what are some of the best practices around application design? What are some of the techniques that they're using? They're sharing across these different product teams. So that's really pretty awesome. And then some of the application teams, like Uma and Chris that were on stage with me uh, on Tuesday, they've taken it a step further and they've created their own product channels for their individual products that Literally hundreds of developers are working aligned to this product. So instead of just a scrum of scrum type of format, these development teams are communicating, collaborating in real time, they're seeing issues, they're able to know what's going on and be able to jump in and help and you know, really streamline the delivery. And again, you're gonna see that in some of our business outcome metrics in a moment. But it's totally transformed how the development teams are working with each other. So, you know, that, again, the transformation is, you know, not just around the technology, but the people, and also the way in which we work and the way in which we collaborate. And it, it's even more open than what I would have envisioned it to be. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, I don't need more than one hand to count the number of folks from my team that actually support all this insane growth, all the developers, uh, that we have any applications that we're onboarding. Uh, so those folks are up here in the front, uh, hopefully took separate flights. <laughs> but uh, it really is an honor and a privilege, because I do push them hard. It really is an honor and a privilege for me to have such talented people uh, working on the team. And you know, I know that uh, the trust that the business partners have with us is just off the charts, so, and that's a testament to the folks that are actually doing the work. I just get to stand up here and take the credit for it. <clears throat> so again, to make this real, uh, these applications are right in the business and customer critical path. They're running real applications, both supporting our frontline employees, the people that are taking phone calls or the people that are in your homes installing product. And then we also have some direct customer facing applications. Some of the URLs that you could go to right now today, they are running on our platform. So things like the splash page for the Xfinity Stream app and you know, a bunch of the other things that are up there, they're you know, absolutely in the customer critical path. And again, <clears throat> I think that I pointed out, at Abby, I had told Abby that we were around 180 million transactions a day. Um, that was maybe a couple of months ago. And now we've gained, I don't know where, but 30 million additional transactions a day. So, you know, the growth, as you saw, is just phenomenal and it keeps growing and growing. So, <clears throat> um, last year, I was talking about tens of millions of transactions a day, and now I'm talking about hundreds of millions of transactions a day. I get a little bit queasy when I think about what next year might be, but 
it's pretty exciting. And uh, we'll probably still have four people supporting the platform. <laughs> All right, to the big reveal. So some of the business outcomes that we've been able to capture and to share First thing was resiliency. That was the biggest. That was the biggest issue that the business had, and um, I know that there's a few folks like Chris and Uma and, and my team that were a little nervous because we actually committed to a 40% reduction in the amount of time that our applications were being impacted by outages, and those outages were impacting our customers as well. So I'm not going to read them all off, but just to put it in the context. An 81% reduction in the amount of time that our applications were impacted is huge. But then when you add the fact that when we did have issues, the teams were able to solve them twice as fast, and the occurrences in terms of frequency was happening half as much. So we definitely got like a huge you know, check mark on resiliency. Totally, you know, even my wild expectations far surpassed. <clears throat> so then time to market. Business always wants to be able to deliver new experiences to our customers faster. This is an average across the platform. So the average across our platform is about a 50% time to market improvement. Pretty significant. There are some of the applications that are off the charts transformational. So taking an idea and putting it into a product as a feature or, or a new service that we offer, that process sometimes could, I've seen it take three, four months. And now that takes less than two weeks. There's instances that we have that much of a transformational difference between idea to feature. So big, big transformation. And another thing I wanna call out is that developer happiness, right? So everybody talks about happy employees are generally more productive, and we've been able to put real metrics behind it to show that the developers that have anywhere from 50 to 75% improvement in productivity, because they're not working on assembling all the infrastructure pieces, they're not doing transactional tickets to get work done, those happy developers are able to get things out to market twice as fast, on average and sometimes a lot faster than that. So that's definitely pretty, tra pretty transformational. And then again, just because Chris Newman is sitting here, <clears throat> one of the examples is our services platform that's in the middle of basically every customer interaction. That's the 250 million transactions a day that's running on that platform. That specific example is on the board there. So there used to be 18 releases a year which is, was an enormous amount of work across many teams in a fairly well-refined process, but using older methodologies. That same application product and all of the development teams that we've enabled to relearn, adopt newer methodologies, are now doing 120 in the same year. So features are getting back to the business that much faster, to our end customers that much faster. Uh, the experience is improving for our customers that much faster. So huge transformational change there. <clears throat> and then scale is pretty important. It's important to note that these applications that are scaling at an incredible pace, that we're improving our resiliency, and then accelerating time to market, they're not sitting still, right? So those same applications that are on the platform while we're moving them to the platform have seen an average increase almost threefold. So scale is really, really important for us. And to be able to do all of these things at the same time in a fairly short window, I think it took us about a year, I think, right? So, you know, it's, pretty, it's a pretty proud moment for us. And again, a big update from last year that we're able to, you know, we're happy to share these these metrics and these business outcomes that the business challenged with and the team totally knocked it out of the park. So it's pretty exciting. <clears throat> now I'm gonna shift focus on where are we at now and what's next? Uh, I'm gonna share 
more granular insight into how we manage the platform and some of the things that we're doing to try and deliver even more services and some of the things that we've recently done. So what this picture really depicts is that even with that insane, ridiculous growth that we had, the four people that we have supporting the platform, we're actually spending less time managing and running the platform and more time with the developers and understanding what their needs are. We're working with them in a real-time collaboration environment every single day. And it's really just, it's unbelievable to even say this, but <clears throat> we probably spend about 80% of the time over the last year with the development teams, understanding what their needs are and delivering new services even with that, that growth, which again, it's a testament to the talent of the folks that we have on the team. So what are some of the ways that we're expanding the platform? I'm happy to announce, and this just timing is everything, and Nithya is here um, and certainly was a big part of helping us give back to the Cloud Foundry community. So Sergey, who's sitting right here, definitely want to talk to him We've open sourced Telegraph for both the build packs as well as for Bosch deployment. And what that means in English is that when application teams spin up applications on our Cloud Foundry environment, one of the things that they requested from us is that, hey, those same metrics and telemetry dashboards that you share with us, it would be awesome if we had that for our applications. And because of the integration with the build pack and the Bosch deployments, now, within moments of birth, anyone that deploys an application onto the platform automatically gets these metrics, and it all happens automatically, and it's no effort on the developer's part. Huge transformation, and again, I'm happy to say that that's all open sourced and available for you all to use, and hopefully, you know, add value to your development teams. There's a few other pieces that I wanted to call out. I'm not going to name every single one of them on, on the slide here, but <clears throat> we started to use Cloud Foundry kind of even beyond just the platform itself. So using components of Cloud Foundry to deliver services uh, even outside of the platform. And actually a really good example, we've heard about Kubo in the conference, which has taken the pieces of Bosch and you know, UAA from Cloud Foundry authentication and authorization and delivering value for spinning up Kubernetes clusters with a single command. So that same pattern we've used to deliver some other services that we've provided first within our Cloud Foundry environment, and then shortly after to the rest of our environment. Things like global load balancing as a service. So we talk about 12-factor apps, multi-site application deployments. Now we enable a programmatic way for people to be able to globally, you know, get that global low bound services so that they can spread their applications wide across multiple availability zones. And the global load balancing services is not a ticket-based transaction. And that's being expanded to not just the Cloud Foundry environment, so that's really key. And then there's a few others there. One I wanna talk about real quick is Janner Lemur. So, uh, Neville, who's sitting up here as well, he wrote that. And folks may have heard of Chaos Lemur that runs around, breaks the environment, tests the resiliency to make sure things are functional. We created Janitor Lemur, which runs around and does cleanup because, sorry, but the developers can be sometimes a little messy and we're lazy. We don't want to constantly sweep up after them. So this takes the application instances that haven't really been doing anything and goes and cleans them up for us because it's so easy to deploy new ones anyway. And it allows us to spend even more time calling up to our developer friends and helping them deliver these awesome experiences to our customers and the business. And that's something that is going to be in process to uh, be contributed back to the open source community. So with you know, the help from our friends like Nithya, we can get that pushed through and make that available. So we're really happy about being contributing back to the community. And uh, we hope to get the generative lemur open sourced quickly so that you all can benefit from a little bit of cleanup. So more insight, more granularity in terms of how do we manage the platform. 
So this slide depicts our overall architecture and strategy for metrics and telemetry. And the strategy is really best depicted with the elements on top, right? The status and notification, eventing, and then the trend analysis that we use. Uh, most of this is all open source. One of the things that we learned really quickly is that there's no one tool to rule them all. So we took very much a microservices architecture approach to monitoring and telemetry, and we picked the pieces that made the most sense for us, that we can manage and scale in a loosely coupled way, and um, not going to go through everything, but you know our infrastructure and platform type metrics, InfluxDB is, is the heart of the, of the system, of the environment. We use Capacitor to provide some business logic as we publish the information uh, that we consume, and again, <clears throat> that all the development teams can also consume as well. Um, and you know, one of the things I would really want to point out that builds that trust, that partnership, as you go through the journey. And I'm going to show you what our dashboards actually look like. All of the information that we use, 100% of the metrics and telemetry that we use to manage the platform, is completely available to all the development teams. So there's no question around, how are things running? My app's not performing right. What's the platform doing and getting that visibility that you might not otherwise get? We completely make that open and transparent. And the feedback we've gotten from the development teams is, really, really positive. They really appreciate the transparency. And when we do have issues on a very rare occasion, uh, we hold forum, talk about what went wrong, we can show the metrics, and then we can also talk about what we're going to do to prevent future occurrences. So they really appreciate that openness and transparency. So we have three examples we're going to show. I'm going to go through it fairly quickly so we can get to some of the Q&A. So this is an example of our platform metrics. So these are on TVs and on people's screens and so forth, and of course any of the development teams that like to keep an eye on us. This is an example of our metrics and telemetry that we use to show the health and status of what's going on in our platform environment. Monitoring telemetry for applications, right? So we talked about the open source tools that are available for you to download today. And this is what we provide automatically for application teams, and it's just a sample. And then, of course, application teams can make changes and add elements that are important to them. But <clears throat> again, this happens within moments of birth of the application without any user intervention at all. And then this provides the infrastructure kind of underlying, do we have enough scale uh, to support the environments, to support the demand? We don't want the development teams to worry about whether or not we have enough capacity to support what it is that they're trying to innovate. So we keep an eye on these type of metrics to make sure that our platform has enough horsepower to perform. And again, this is for internal and external as well, but you know, we always want to make sure that we have enough scale to support the environment. A few of the big lessons learned, we've stepped on a lot of landmines for sure, but this is representative of kind of the best advice that we can give and we talk to a lot of companies and this is usually encapsulates what we talk about. If you're an infrastructure team that's working to deliver this, I, I can't overstate the shift in focus from focusing on the infrastructure to delivering platforms and services and getting closer to the development teams. It's hugely important. You can manage the environment using things like Puppet and Ansible and so forth, but the faster that you learn things like Bosch and Concourse and have CI CD pipelines for how you upgrade and manage your own underlying Cloud Foundry environment, the sooner that you're going to lay, make life a lot easier for yourself. So, definitely, that's a big um, piece of advice because. You know, some things like Bosch are not the easiest thing to pick up. There, there's a little bit of a learning curve, um, but the uh, sooner you do it, the easier your life will become. The emphasis on partnership and community. Again, just huge. Um, 
you saw the development teams up on stage. You know, we're, we're, we're really one team. Uh, we don't really look at it in terms of uh, organizational boundaries. So we're all in it together. You definitely want to establish that sense of community and partnership with the development teams. And then simply stated, if you make it easy, you do not have to worry about adoption. So that insane level of growth, zero outbound marketing from us, it's really just all the development teams talking, telling a friend and so forth, um, and being able to deliver value with much less effort. And that's what enabled our environment to scale. There was no mandate, thou shalts, must nots. It, it all just happened organically. And again, because we provided a safe environment for the development teams to learn and grow and adopt these new methodologies. So that's a big piece of advice as well. So just to wrap things up, because I do uh, think that it's invaluable to talk to the folks that are doing all of the work, get some questions going. Um, start together, bring friends. Um, no one wants to go in alone, so you really want to start this together. There's comfort in numbers. We focused a lot on people. Um, the, the technology change can be complex, but once you get everybody committed and on board and comfortable that you're in it together and channel people's passions, then it's a lot easier to make all the technology changes that you need to make. Start small. Don't try to solve world hunger. Just feed the family first. Be strategic about the applications that you, that you start to migrate first so that you can capture the wins and communicate the business value. As you Establish an open forum and a feedback loop. Make sure that you're actually listening to customers. So all of the things that we deliver is based directly on the customer feedback. So they feel that, right? So you wanna make sure that you definitely listen to your customers. Having a solid foundation is fairly intuitive. Uh, automate everything. So we're able to support this environment because of just completely ruthless levels of automation. Automation is in our DNA. Uh, there's not anything that we do that we don't look for ways to automate that so we don't have to do it again manually. And that enables us to really spend all of the amount of time that we do collaborating with the product teams and the development organizations. And then lastly, but most importantly, join the community. You're all here as part of the Cloud Foundry Foundation community and give back. Give back and sharing the lessons that you've learned. We learn a ton uh, from you all as well. So if you've created capabilities in your environment, please contribute those back to the community. We're seeing a lot of growth in contributions for Cloud Foundry, which is awesome to see. Uh, I'd love to see that you know, happen even faster. And <clears throat> even just sharing the stories. So we're, we're here to share with you, but we're also here to listen and learn from you all as well. So. You know, I really do mean it when I say that, you know, we're anxious to get feedback, we're anxious to have conversations. Um, we're gonna leave time for Q&A now. And, uh, but, you know, it's not a one and done. So we're, you know, we're here for the rest of the conference and really excited to, uh, to talk to you all. Thank you very much. Go ahead, there's a question. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Certainly appreciate the uh, the challenge. Um, <laughs> so the, the the question was was around how awesome has our platform and the work that we've done improved the customer experience? And you know, I think that I shared some of the metrics with you, right? So we know that when our products are working, people love our products. Okay, uh, we don't want to be Netflix. We, we've We've communicated that, you know, we have a premium product, 
And we, you know, our customers expect a premium experience. And folks interact with our product more so than most any other product I can think of, right? So just the always on internet and Wi-Fi and all the other products and services that we have. So we know that when we can create a, an experience that is a self-healing, when problems can correct themselves because of our ability to scale up and scale down applications, responding to business demands in real time, that's a way that we've enabled our applications to support our customers. Uh, so that 81% reduction in the amount of time that we're impacting uh, folks' ability to call and get service or to activate new products, that definitely helps improve the customer experience. Uh, we've shown pretty significant gains, and again, we have a lot of work to do for sure, um, but in our net promoter scores, in terms of customer satisfaction, we've seen really big strides in improvement and I can't share necessarily a direct correlation between you know, net promoter score, the customer satisfaction, and some of these metrics, but we do know that when our products and services are more available, then customers don't have to call in, and the products just work. Uh, so creating that experience where things are more self-healing and more self-service. Um, I don't know, Chris, if you want to talk about some of the digital first type initiatives, you want to come on up? Thank you, sir. Yeah, so for that one in particular, actually, uh, there's a metric that we've been tracking for a while that we refer to as customer dissatisfaction. Um, and a couple of years ago, we started correlating that to uh, a line graph also showing the availability or what was at the time the lack thereof uh, of our systems. Uh, and there was, I forget what the correlation number was, but it was so incredibly closely correlated uh, that the business was really pressing on us around that's really the impetus to improve. Um, so not surprisingly, after implementation of the platform and all the journey that Greg just described, uh, our customer dissatisfaction line has gone, gone down in correlation to the uptime of our, our environments. The next leg of the journey, as, as Greg just alluded to, is, is certainly around digital first. Uh, that's where we want to provide a mechanism for our customers to interact with us first through their smartphone or Xfinity.com or whatever the case may be uh, without having to pick up the phone and call a person or more likely pick up the phone and go through the IVR and wait on hold for a while and then get the person. Um, so not unlike some of the web scale companies like Netflix and Amazon, we really want that to be the first way that customers can engage with us. Awesome. That's a way to start the Q&A, that's cool. <laughs> hey, we are open, right? So, um, no, it was a great question, thank you. Based on traffic? Yeah. So, so let me uh, so let me just repeat the question and, and tell me if I got it right. So the question was. We talked about three, we chose three services for our strategic uh, selection process. And was that based on traffic? And the answer is, is that, you know, certainly there was a lot of traffic. These were the services that were called most frequently. And there was also another dimension, which was in terms of the resiliency, they were also the, the critical pieces of the services platform that uh, were, were most likely to cause other you know, kind of near neighbor type of issues as well. So the, the three services that we, we chose was not just based on traffic, but also the potential impact for improving our customer experience. So, and again, that was a testament to, to Chris and the development team in terms of choosing and being really ambitious with respect to the services we chose. That's a good question. Anything else, Bridget? You had a slide with some monitoring tools, and 
and you mentioned that um, this obviously looking at monitoring tools, you develop, you know, you develop those capabilities over time. And it seemed like a very realistic slide. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the decisions behind some of the monitoring tools. That is an awesome question. And I'm just going to be kind of shameless, and I'm going to give an opportunity to some of the folks to come on up. So, yes. All right, so the, the question was, and uh, I can flip back to it. So the question was around our monitoring and telemetry strategy. There was a lot of pieces up there, and it, we do get a lot of questions about this. So the question was, you know, can we provide more granular detail into how we selected the pieces and what the benefits are? And I wanted to, you know, bring up the folks that actually were responsible for it. Sure. Thanks. So, um, so my name's Tim, um, and this is Sergey. So, uh, sir, uh, you when we <laughs> Wait. Yeah, they should have worn like thing one, two, three, four. Yeah. Thing one, two, three, four. Yeah. So I don't know. He's number one. Um, so uh, the uh, so the strategy kind of built organically, and uh, one of the things that we really wanted to depict with this picture is that what Greg alluded to was that we chose the best tool for the be for the job and decomposed our monitoring strategy into things. InfluxDB is a really great. Um, uh, time series metrics database, it's very fast and reliable. Uh, Capacitor does a really good job at uh, massaging those numbers and being able to do some business logic on it. Um, Grafana, you know, uh, is, a, is a great, obviously, is a, is a great um, trending tool to, to be able to visualize some of these metrics. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, just, we just, over time, came up with this strategy, um, and I don't know if there's really any... Uh, um, overall thing that we can say to say this is the best. It's just that, you know, look at what works for you and just employ that for that specific job. Don't look for something that's going to do everything for you at once. Actually, you know, I, I forgot, right, because I'm getting old and my memory is failing, but so, Tim, do you want to talk about the Bosch config box? It's kind of like a little box down there, and it's not open source yet, but again, in the spirit of of giving back. Do you, yeah, do you want to I mean, that was that? one of the challenges we had was that, you know, the platform's always changing, right? So, so when you're deploying new VMs, when you're scaling, you're always going to have new things you need to monitor. So we have a method by which we can take a Bosch config and translate that into a Nagios config. Um, and we use Nagios because it's simple, it's extensible, and, and everything else, and it does a pretty good job. So um, we were able to, to build a script that will generate uh, a Nagios config based off of um, uh, a Bosch uh, Bosch output or the Bosch API. Yeah, so that means that we don't have to worry about forgetting, oops, you know, this component changed or the IP changed or whatever the case might be. It allows us, to, again, to just spend more time with our development friends than, you know, worrying about managing the platform. But, again, that's something that we're going to work on contributing back. And, again, you know, Nithya, glad you're here. Uh, I think that, you know, folks might benefit from, from that. Yeah. Um, what, one sec. There's, so, you, so you use this really for platform monitoring, primarily, or at the application level, or both? Uh, it is both. It, 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 it is both. And um, so th th this this topic actually might need a separate se session. <laughs> it's pretty big. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll address this, this question. So from selection and strategy perspective, what strategy do we have to select this, this, this components? Um, well, one of the strategy is we don't want to commit for 20 years from now. Uh, we want to build system not based on a, you know, some one single enterprise solution that is not replaceable, but instead pick up pieces that can be replaced when there will be a new product that will fit better. So work on work on standards, industry standards, or, 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 or you know, the standards. Um, don't try to do too much proprietary things. Uh, select components that are play well with other vendors, other products. And make sure that you can, you can easily pick up, remove one component and replace it with something, new technology that will be available next year. So that is, that is on, a, on, a, on a strategy. <laughs> Um, question about 
about a monitoring platform or and um, applications. Uh, we do both, and um, Greg mentioned Telegraph Build Pack. So this is one of the things that we we started to use very actively to monitor the platform, but also. A lot once once we start to advertise and release it to show to to our consumers in Comcast, many teams started to use it right away. So what this this build pack is, is doing? You just create a telegraph.conf configuration, and you do CF push this configuration. That's it. You don't need anything else, and it will automatically spin out a telegraph instance based on this configuration. You can bind. Influx database to this to this application, and it will start to stream your your metrics to that application. So, our consumers, application teams, DevOps teams, are very active and love this feature. So they're using this for application monitoring as well. And again, you know, we're we're here uh, all, all week as well. I want to make sure that we answer any other questions. I think we might be at time. I'm kind of looking at Bridget to see. But um, yeah, Sergey's obviously uh, you know, very knowledgeable and proud of the contributions we made. Certainly, you can look at the source code. Do we have any other, do we have any other questions that we, can, that we can answer quickly, or are we? OK, so we, I'm sorry. We are at time, but what we'll do is uh, we'll come down and we'll come and talk to you in, Talk outside so that we can get uh, the room, give the room back. But, uh, all right, thanks a lot.